LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com The United States today occupies a unique position in the history of the world. It is the only empire that exists. This is the first time in recorded history that it has ever happened that there is only one country, one empire. It's sadly ironic that this nation has become such an empire. We in the United States don't realize that our corporations have created this very subtle, very clandestine empire. The American empire is really in many ways killing the planet. The definition of empire didn't change. The definition of American did. In only 200 years, we've lost our freedom and we've gone from a nation on the way to the most fantastic ideals to a country leading the world in deceit. Who owns this country? Rich and the very rich. The Federal Reserve System is not a government agency at all. What is it? It's a cartel. It's obviously a corrupt system. I think the crisis coming is going to make the 1930s look like a picnic. We keep going where we're going. Uh, it really is off a cliff. It's off a cliff environmentally. It's off a cliff socially. It's off a cliff as far as poverty and wealth. And definitely off a cliff as far as any real democratic control. Power is concentrating. We are undermining our ecological systems. You might even call it ecocide that we're committing. In whose interest is it that we eat the way that we are? Who's profiting from this and why? We're making changes where we have completely no idea of the consequences. We are living in a chemical controlled country. There is a merger between commercial interests and political interests. The merger of state and corporate powers too big to fail, and the rest of us are too small to say. No rational person assumes that we can continue on this course. We have a government that right now can shut down the internet. That's dictatorship. The empire is unveiling itself. If one group of people has control over society, we call it dictatorship. Because of the Patriot Act, police can come into your house, and they don't need the order of the judge. It's a dictatorship over the earth. It reflects an act of collective madness. Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is John Michael Greer, who joins us to discuss his book, Decline and Fall, The End of Empire and the Future of Democracy in 21st Century America. Things fall apart. The centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Although he was writing nearly a century ago, William Butler Yeats could just as easily be describing the United States today. The decline and fall of America's global empire is the central feature of today's geopolitical landscape and the nature of our response to it will determine much of our future trajectory, with implications that reach far beyond the limits of one nation's borders. Decline and fall challenges the conventional wisdom of empire. Using a wealth of historical examples, combined with groundbreaking original analysis, it shows how the United States has backed itself into a blind corner in the pursuit of political and economic power, explores the inevitable consequences of imperial collapse, and proposes a renewal of democratic institutions as the only constructive way forward. By shifting the conversation from whether today's American empire should survive to whether it can survive, and arguing persuasively that the answer to the latter question is no, Decline and Fall makes an invaluable contribution to the body of speculative post-industrial literature. It's a must-read for anyone concerned about where the world is headed and what, if anything, we can do about it. Hello and welcome, John, and thank you so much for joining us again on LegalizeFreedom.com. It's a pleasure to be on again. Excellent. Well, John, today we're going to talk a little bit about issues arising from your 
I think it's your latest book, certainly a, a recent one. Uh, title is Decline and Fall, The End of Empire and the Future of Democracy in 21st Century America. Um, mm-hmm. Before we get started on that, tell listeners a bit about your background and just give us a quick overview of the book. <laughs> okay. My background is perhaps... Um I, I don't know how well that will that will translate, except well to this audience, very possibly. Um, I've been a student of um, of environmental issues and a range of things connected to that for a very long time, and of course, automatically that involves an an interest in in politics that that developed into an interest in history because you really can't understand the political conflict, conflicts of the present until you know where they came from and how they unfolded um, right now of course everybody is celebrating if that's the right word the the hundredth anniversary of the start of the first world war and that's a really good example of how um, a set of conflicts that itself was rooted in history kicked things onto a trajectory that we're really still dealing with today so all of that fed into my interest in um, how empires rise and fall, not least because I live in um, the United States right now, which has the world's largest empire, and that empire is showing every sign of falling, so obviously I got interested in that and did a lot of research. Um, the, the brief overview of the book, I suppose I've just summed up, um, the, it, is very, it, it, it is very unfashionable to say right now the United States has an empire, but of course it does, um, and empires fall. That's one of the most predictable things about them. Um, those of our listeners who are in Britain will have some direct personal experience of that, either in their own lives or that of their parents or grandparents. Um, empires fall. They fall in a fairly predictable fashion. Once you figure out where you are in the trajectory, it's fairly easy to pick to, to say, okay, and this and this and this and this and down we go. So my, the question that I wanted to explore in the book was primarily a matter of, okay, here's where we are. Here are the things, like like a functioning democracy, that we ditched in America in the process of getting our overseas empire. And is there any possibility that we might be able to dust off what remains of democratic institutions and put them back to use as our empire falls to bits around us? Well, you mentioned being not fashionable to talk about empire. One thing that is currently in vogue is talk about uh, where our civilization is headed, specifically that it might actually be headed into the, the, um, as you like to say, the compost bin that it, mm-hmm. could, it could be over. But in your previous works, and certainly in this one, you've pointed out that empires rise and fall, but no, not necessarily, it d- that doesn't necessarily mean the end of civilization per se. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they overlap. Mm-hmm. And you're not saying, you know, the American empire is winding down now, what that's going to look like. You speculate a lot about that, and that's what we're going to be talking about. But that doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily mean the end of, you know, human civilization per se. I think a lot of people leap to that, um, because mm-hmm. just of the you know sort of apocalyptic times that we're living in, very much so, yeah. And the the thing is, the, the fact that a given civilization goes down doesn't mean that civilization is over. This is another thing. I mean, if if you were a citizen of the Roman Empire in the year 400 A.D., let's say, you were looking at the end of Roman civilization, the end of the classical world. Um, a cycle of civilization that had been going since about 1000 BC was coming to an end around you. That didn't mean that the project of civilization was over, but it did mean that your civilization was living on borrowed time at that point. We're in a very similar situation now. Industrial civilization, the mode of civilization that we've been used to, the the sort of the thing that evolved um, gradually out of the wreckage of the Roman world, um, is on its way out. And it's on its way out much faster than than some other civilizations have been, simply because it, it... um, bet its survival on access to an endless supply of fossil fuels, and that doesn't exist. And so there are certain things that we can see happening in the, around us that have to do with the twilight of in Western industrial civilization as we've known it. Will there be other civilizations in the future? Of course. Are there possibility? Are there things we can do now to help things along to make sure that things that might be potentially very useful to the future get there? Of course there are, and there are there are ways to make the decline less catastrophic than it would otherwise be, and so on and so forth. So there's all kinds of intermediate levels between the American Empire is falling and life is over, <laughs> and you're right that people very often miss that point. Well, of course, there's been, as you point out, there's been empires have risen and fallen since forever, really. You know, go back in time, many examples, and you know, life on Earth, human life prevailed um, despite that. However, the sort of it's different this time <laughs> aspect that we have here is that the industrial age, you mentioned sort of the, the cheap energy, that has enabled uh, an empire that's really not, as far as we can tell, like anything that's come before. Well, it's bigger. 
It's bigger and it can throw around more energy. It covers more land space. It has more toys. And yet, if you, if you go back and read, say, some of the records of the late Roman Empire or of, um, of ancient Egypt, Babylonia, the various Chinese empires as they rise and fall, you'll find that all of these technological toys, all this energy, is basically being used in the service of the same bad habits. So the difference is, the different, there's a difference of scale. I'm by no means sure that there's actually a difference of kind there. Now, one of the problems with the, with the difference of scale is that we've built up a global population that cannot be sustained. There, there is no way that 7 billion, much less 8 or 9 billion people can survive indefinitely on this very small planet. And unfortunately, that means we're going to see some severe population declines in the centuries ahead as, as population gets down to what can be supported indefinitely. That's going to be ugly. But you know, human beings are among, are among nature's supreme generalist species. We're like rats and cockroaches. We're very difficult to exterminate. Well, quite. I mean, um, as far as the population issue goes, that's another hot button um, topic <laughs> these days. But, um, and people wondering, you know, a lot of talk about, you know, uh, elites wanting to exterminate populations, et cetera, et cetera, you know, eugenics and sterilization, mm-hmm. all the rest of it. I think it'll probably be a bit more mundane than that, if mundane is the right word, in, in the sense that, if uh, you were to try and put it on a micro scale as an example, uh, if you took a small desert island with you know mm-hmm. some fresh water and some uh, food sources, uh, you put two people on there, maybe you don't have a problem. You put 20, 200, at some point, in nature actually steps in. So it probably is not going to need some sort of nefarious elite to, to depopulate the earth. It's oh, like, yeah. whether it's natural disasters or famines or disease, I think that, that the, you know, the earth will do that you know, for us. Oh yeah. The thing is, if you look at the, what happened in in the aftermath of the Soviet Union, um, the the, what, the the mess of countries that used to be the Soviet Union um, have had drastic declines in population. They're losing population at a rate that will have their population down by about half by tw- by 2100. And it's not happening because people are going around, you know, engaging in eugenics or genocide. It's happening because. As the economy contracts, as um, resource availability diminishes, as a range of other factors bite down, death rates go up, birth rates go down, um, a lot of people drink themselves to death. There's a whole range of things that factor in there. And it's not, it doesn't involve mass die-off. You can, very, very modest changes in the relative ratio of births and deaths can set a population dropping like a rock. And... You, you, it can happen without people even really noticing it, just as the population boom. I mean, when I was born, this planet had half as many people on it as it does today. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm in my early 50s. That didn't happen because we had these vast orgies of reproduction and childbirth in the streets or anything like that. It happened just because people were having one or two more children. And in the same way, we could see the population of this planet drop by 90% over a period of a century. And what that would mean, if you know 100 people, there would be two extra funerals every year. Just two funerals beyond what you, what you experience now. You'd notice it, but would it be a big deal? Well, maybe not. Well, of course, when it came your turn to be the guest of honor at the funeral, uh, you would notice that and, and, until it happened. But, but you get my point, that it does that these basic shifts in demographics actually can happen very subtly and can happen, it, it seems very normal. It's just, you know, the death rate's up, um, more people are dying of, of you know, infections that we used to be able to treat with antibiotics, food is a little harder to come by, okay, and there was a war and a whole bunch of young men went marching out and most of them didn't come back. It rinse and repeat for 100 years and you got 10% of the population you originally did. And I expect that's about how it's going to happen. Now, for, as we'll discuss the three E's a little bit later on, um, reasons why the uh, American empire is, is winding down um, economy, energy, environment. You point out, you, you walk through the sort of uh, history of the, the British empire, which you referred to earlier, and how that was unwound in a, you know, a relatively um, fuss-free sort of way. And mm-hmm. it didn't take down you know, the British nation um, mm-hmm. A lot of um, the, what was there during empire remained. It's just it didn't have that global reach and all that sort of um, mm-hmm. infrastructure. And there is things, lots of parallels between the current situation with uh, the US. But mm-hmm. also you pointed out that there, there are lessons that could be learned here that are not 
being paid attention to, mm-hmm. partly right. because, and it, was, it tickled me in the book how you were saying, but the, a lot of people in the US at whatever level not taking Britain seriously, not taking that age of empire seriously. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm always reminded of, uh, you know, rogue voices stick out. And uh, I don't know if you, if you know Lyndon LaRouche, but mm-hmm. anytime he's on the media, uh, he can't get a sentence out without going, the British, it's the British. And he's still deadly serious about British influence, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people, your side of the pond are, are not. Mm-hmm. No, the, the thing is, Americans think of Britain as a cute little country. We think of Britain the way you guys think of Luxembourg. You know, this this cute little country over there with all these quaint customs, and they have a queen, isn't that darling? And, and oh, yeah, they got in the way of, of a war a couple of times. We had to send the troops over. It, it, these things happen. It, it's funny, because not that long ago, 100 years ago, um, Britain was practically America's national enemy. And who did we fight the Revolutionary War against? Who did we fight the War of 1812 against, which our national anthem is about? Um, there were a lot of people who thought of Britain as this vast, sprawling, almost demonic power dominating the globe as it was in 1914. I don't know, demonic, well, that's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let that, that judgment um, be made by those who actually had to experience it. Certainly the Irish thought so. But, um, but Britain was the most powerful nation on the planet. It ruled, what, a quarter of the Earth's land surface, which is, I believe, history's biggest empire by a, by, by a significant margin. And it did not rule that gently at all. <laughs> um, the British Army, the British Navy, were always going someplace in the world to blow away a bunch of natives who had the, the effrontery to want to govern their own lives. And so the transformation by which America came to think of Britain not as, you know, the empire, the red coats, the, the, the evil empire of its day, uh, to Britain, this quaint little country over there that we had to rescue a couple of times, is a very complicated thing, a very interesting thing, an example of the almost complete historical amnesia that we have over in this country. I was reminded yesterday there was an item in the news um, with, you know, regarding all the shenanigans going on in the Middle East at the minute. Well, that has mm-hmm. ever, ever been the case, really. But one U.S. general talking about, uh, I'm not sure if he's a lone voice, but uh, the possibility of going back into Iraq, um, you know, should the, the America's national interest be served. And in the light of, for example, the scenario you set out in your book, this is starting to look kind of pathetic um, as things stand. I mean, what was the U.S. got? Is it like between 800 and 1,000 overseas military bases in over 130 countries? I mean that that's it's absolutely unsustainable, and people say why why do they why do they need that? But of course there was a time when that's how the empire was you know policed. You just look at the parallels with the the Roman Empire, for example, and all their outposts. But exactly. or the British Empire with all of its outposts. There were British troops a hundred years ago over half the planet. And you wonder how they really had the people to do that when the population was a lot lower then. But yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. Well, I mean. That's that's why there was such a the 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 in the in the British Raj in India, there was a huge percentage of the military force that kept that in existence that was raised locally, and that happened in in, in most other British colonies. You had um, you know in East Africa you had the Kenyan Rifles and so on. Um, native troops were raised under British officers. Um, it didn't work out too well in the long run, but that was the that was the approach at the time. We don't do that, America. Um, whether we're not so we're not quite so clever, or because we have a much more surplus population, or what, um, we're still hiring all of our all of our soldiers domestically, as far as I know. Um, but yeah, the thing you have to remember is that an empire is not there is is not there for, in, at random. It is not there for the health of the soldiers who are being stationed in 140 exotic uh, exotic locations around the world. It's there for financial reasons. An empire is a wealth pump. It pumps money out of the subject colonies into the imperial nation. In the in, in the days of the British Empire, you know, all the world's wealth flowed into London, and that meant it flowed out of every British colony in the world. Um, it's it's a point that the people finesse. Uh, Neil Ferguson, who was one, who was of course a very popular historian, well popular in some circles, unpopular in others, but a very well known British historian these days. Um, he he talks he talks in great length this one of his books about the British Empire about you know the British Empire in India and how wonderful it is and in the same book he mentioned that in 1600 India was the richest country on the planet and Britain was a soggy little backwater mostly known for codfish 
And in 1900, Britain was the economic center of the world, and India was the poorest country on the planet. Now, what happened? What happened was the British Empire. What happened was that, that Britain's empire and India stripped the country to the bare walls. We're doing the same thing. The United States is doing the same thing to every country under its control. We did it to Latin America. Um, in 1900, Argentina and the United States had the same income per capita. Um, in 1980, 1990, today, <laughs> not a chance. We looted them. We plundered them. That's what empire is about. It's what it's always about. And so if you remember to look, if you look, look, follow the money. Look where the cash goes. Look who gets rich, whose capital gets the monumental architecture and the, you know, all of the, the big museums full of wealth stolen from all over the planet and all this stuff. That's how you know where the imperial center is. That's where the money goes. At the moment, it's Washington, D.C. Um, and, and New York City, of course, which is kind of our financial sub-capital. A um, hundred years ago, it was London. A um, few hundred years before then, it was Madrid. It, it, it just, it's one of those familiar things. But if you don't pay attention to the money, you're going to miss what's actually going on because it's not about being a global policeman. It's not about um, upholding Western values or any of the, the twaddle that we get from, um, you know, from, from the various fanboys of empire. Um, it's about money. It's about ripping off the rest of the world so you can get rich. Now, we mentioned that the British Empire was unwound without too much incident in mm -hmm. two, sense. World war, two world wars in the Great Depression. As empires go, that's not bad. Yeah, and uh, of course, but the American situation is likely, partly because of the way it's being handled, you know, with mm -hmm. a lot of denial, it's likely to be much more profound in terms of its impact on uh, yeah. U.S. population. Now, of course, other things have changed in the interim. You know, the world at large is facing problems, you know, uh, the three E's I mentioned, energy, environment, mm -hmm. economy. And those will affect, will affect us here in, in uh, Europe, uh, people okay. in Australia, people all over the world are going to be affected. However, mm -hmm. the U.S. with its such a disproportionate allocation of resources mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. you know, basically a, a, a couple of generations or more, that's going to be felt more keenly um, than, for example, yeah. someone living in sub-Saharan Africa who's basically never had anything anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. Um, the, the thing that Britain did that um, has not often happened. There's a couple of cases in history, but the thing that Britain did was recognize after the First World War that its empire was in fact winding down. And especially in, during and after the Second World War, the realization that you could not hold on to this empire any longer. Britain could have dragged itself down very effectively by trying to cling to an empire it could no longer afford um, the, the way we are now. And now, of course, it didn't hurt that it had a 500-pound gorilla named the United States standing over Britannia's prostrate form saying, from now on, the world empire is ours, thank you. And that may have helped the, helped the transition a little bit. But they didn't fight it. And that was a very good thing, and that's one of the reasons why you've preserved a decent standard of living. Um, when Spain lost its global empire, it ended up being plunged into a couple of centuries of economic and political turmoil, civil war, all kinds of ugly things, from which it has still not really recovered. So, yes, it can get really ugly. The, the major problem the United, the United States faces right now is that, first of all, Americans insist that we don't have an empire and that it's not falling, and this fall doesn't matter anyway. Yes, those are mutually, you know, those are mutually exclusive statements. Get used to it. Double talk like that is very common in the U.S. these days. So people are insisting that you know, we don't have an empire, and of course we're as strong as we always were, and we, we've got to be the world's policemen, Western values, all the twaddle I mentioned earlier, all of which is basically a way to try to pretend that we can keep on doing this, keep on monopolizing a, a, a third of the world's wealth, roughly. And we can't. We can't afford it anymore. We're going broke as a nation. We've got um, the Fed is busy printing money hand over fist just to pay our bills. That's not going to end well. And I think everybody knows it. But the alternative is actually standing down from empire. It's actually you know, starting to hand over the various, our various imperial entanglements to other nations and, and nobody wants to do that because the economic consequences will be so severe. Well, in terms of uh, the economy in the U.S., obviously there's been outsourcing uh, going mm -hmm. on for uh, uh, feverishly for for some time, and, and you know it's the same here in, in the U.K. Mm -hmm. and in, in a lot of Europe, apart from maybe Germany. You know, we don't really make anything anymore. I, mean, I don't remember the last time when I was growing up in the 1970s. We had a British-made television. 
I mean, mm -hmm. such a thing doesn't exist now. <laughs> if you want a British TV, you'll have to find one from the 70s. Um, <laughs> and the result has been, again, we're talking in many parts around the globe, but we're focusing here on the US, that you have an abstract paper um, mm -hmm. economy where, you know, the money markets are the only real place to, to, you know, to make any profit. And you see, for example, I'm not quite sure what's happening in the US with the quantitative easing program. But it's probably the same as here, but certainly the government has recently done things like, for example, cancel a multi-billion pound program to refurbish schools because there was quote unquote no money, but then put much more in terms of billions in quantitative easing. And that's gone straight into the money market and speculation. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's, that's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, basically, quantitative easing here is, can be understood very simply. Nobody actually wants to buy U.S. Treasury bills anymore. Um, for obvious reasons. We have, we're, we're basically spinning the presses, turning out unpayable IOUs, and everybody knows it. If the U.S. actually had to fund its debt at market prices, we'd be bankrupt in a week. So what's happening, what quantitative easing amounts to here, is that the Fed prints money to buy U.S. Treasury debt. Our national debt is being funded by spinning the presses. It is that simple at this point. And because that, you know, Yes, that ends up with an economy like Zimbabwe's. Okay, anybody who's paying attention knows that. The question is, how long can the pyramid of fictitious debt be kept up? And we're going to find out because it's it's very clear nobody's willing to actually bite the bullet and deal with um, the federal government having to default on its debt, which is the other alternative. And we've really backed ourselves into a corner. That there is now the federal government, because again it can simply borrow as much money as it wants by printing the money to pay for its um, bills. Um, the place where we're seeing the financial uh, the financial uh, thing cramp clamp down is in state and local governments, which are going broke at an astonishing rate. There are at this point counties in the United States that have to have had to lay off their police force completely. There is no police force in these counties. There are no, there, you know, if a, if a crime gets committed, oh well. There are places that have no fire protection. Um, the city of Detroit, which is kind of ground zero for this at this point, um, has ended up cutting off water to what tens of thousands of its residents because it can't, afford, you know, the, the bills haven't been paid and it can't afford to keep on uh, providing them with running water. And there are very large sections of Detroit that have no urban services at all, no water, no power, no fire protection, no lights, nothing. This kind of thing is becoming increasingly common in the United States because the states can't print their own money, you see. So they're actually having to, having to face the, um, the, the brunt of the economic contraction, like the, the, the program to refurbish schools. The thing about quantitative easing is that everybody, it's got to go into the financial industry and stay there, or you get running, runaway hyperinflation immediately. Now, we're probably going to get runaway hyperinflation down the road anyway, but at the moment, as long as they can just keep on tossing this stuff into the financial markets and keep it out of the economy where actual goods and services are exchanged, they can pretend that it's not going to blow up on them. So I think that's that's what's going on with the the um, you know the, this this repairing the schools program you mentioned. That would put money into people's hands. That would involve hiring workers. It would involve um, buying raw materials. It would involve money going into the general economy. And there's where you start risking inflation because if the money is just being spun out of the presses, uh, what's to stop it from just spinning and spinning and spinning? So that's the mess we're in. You mentioned the situation in Detroit with the water. Just as an aside, I mean, I watched a documentary, coincidentally, about a week ago, specifically about this. Um, it was basically an extended news report. But at one point, they were focusing, and there's two or three people they focused on their situation. There was this one woman living in a house, the water had been cut off, and it showed you her, it was eerie, her walking to the nearest house of a person she knew and bringing back buckets of water on her head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, what does this remind you of? And then at mm -hmm. one point, there's a problem because the water's been cut off. For some reason, it compromises the sewage system mm -hmm, yeah. and the sewage starts to back up. And basically, mm -hmm. her cellar ends up half full of raw sewage. Oh, dear. And she's down there, you know, up to her waist in it. Then she ends up splashing around, ends up getting some of it in her mouth and she's vomiting. And the whole thing is just completely gross. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. if this isn't third world... 
that I don't know what is. Yeah, the, uni- the, thing, the thing that I think most people don't realize is that the United States is a third world country. It was briefly part of the industrial world, but in the 70s, we got rid of all of our industry. At this point, we produce raw materials and we import all of our manufactured products, like any other third world country. The only thing that makes us different from um, any third world country you care to name is that right now we've got the world's biggest military and the world's biggest empire. Both of those are driving us into bankruptcy, and so the emergence of a third world America, basically one big banana republic, is not that far away. In terms of the debt, uh, we talked about you know the huge amount of debts being racked mm-hmm. up, and once again, this is the same with most governments all around the world. I mean, we're undergoing. I mean, you've mentioned there's various cuts and things happening left, right, and centre in the U.S. because uh, the money's gone into financial markets, but also the government's talking about trying to get the deficit down. It's mm-hmm. exact. It's exactly the same over here. But mm-hmm. then you look at the numbers and you realise that uh, the government's debt is actually rising all the time. It's mm-hmm. never been bigger. So this debt will never be repaid simply because it cannot be repaid. Exactly. Uh, how it unwinds, at what point people recognize that? <clears throat> you postulate, for example, in the book that maybe it'll just quietly be devalued and just quietly go away as the real world of actual physical problems looms ever larger, things we need mm-hmm. to deal with on a day-to-day basis, and suddenly no one's got time anymore for a load of paper abstractions. I don't think that's the most likely outcome, but it's possible. It's possible that, um, for example, the last day that, that um, the stock market on Wall Street is open, the Dow may be at 374,228 in dollars that don't mean anything anymore. Um, my own guess is that what, what's going to happen is that down the, at some point down the road, the United States is going to hit a major political crisis, possibly a major military crisis, and there's going to be a default. Because if a debt can't be paid back, it won't be paid back. The question is whether they're just going to default, whether they're going to do selective defaults and just let things roll from there. I don't. I. I, I don't expect hyperinflation because that's that. That would um, basically get rid of the value of everything owned by the rich, who are not particularly interested in seeing that happen. So I, I would expect defaults. But you know, one way or another. One way or another, it's going to go away. You can't just keep on building infinite piles of debt. What has been what what passes for thought in the minds of governments these days, I think, is pretty much that um, they they think of this as an abnormal time. They think of this as a temporary weird time when things aren't working, but it's going to straighten out. Growth is going to return if we just keep on hanging on. They do not grasp that the world has changed. They do not grasp that the last couple of centuries have been writing a bubble on fossil fuels, that what we're used to, this sort of constant growth economy, is a really bizarre time in the history of the world, and now it's over. And now we face stagnation and decline in economic terms, a situation where economies contract in, in real terms year over year. Our economic systems can't deal with that. Everything we, we do is based on the idea that money should make money, that the average investment should grow in value year over year. In a contracting economy, on average, all investments lose money year over year. We can't deal with that. We have no way to think around that. In modern economics, our, polit- our modern political system, we go on. The whole system assumes growth, and now that real, in real terms, growth is not happening. That's being covered up by the fact that um, transactions like the generation of derivatives add to the GDP. So they can keep on spinning out endless amounts of bogus paper wealth, and it looks like the economy is still growing. But if you remove all financial wealth and just get down to actual goods and services, the GDPs have been shrinking for years. That's the thing, that's the rock on which, or the iceberg, if you will, on which the, the, you know, the, the Titanic of modern industrial society has already wrecked itself. And so there are there are huge changes in the offing as that reality becomes harder and harder to miss, as the towering piles of bogus wealth become ever more evanescent. And it's it's the, it's really the supreme political fact of our time that and nobody wants to deal with it. Um, I visited Iceland after they uh, held the middle finger up to the international banks. Mm-hmm. And everything looked normal there. It was a mm-hmm. very, very pleasant stay. In fact, it was probably better than going pre uh, the crash because prices had come back down again, and no longer did you pay 
you know, uh, $20 for a coffee or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But that Iceland's a very small country and mm-hmm. uh, people were almost able to sort of brush that off and the amounts of money concerned, although large, were by no means sort of astronomical sums we're talking about with the US. I can't imagine what would happen on the morning of the US saying to some other, I mean, I think China holds the majority of the US debt. It's like, sorry, you know, deal is off. You're not getting it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that, I'm pretty sure that that's, gonna, that's going to have to involve a massive political or military crisis. Um, because, yeah, the backlash would be tremendous. Um, I mean, China owns a lot of our debt. Russia owns a lot of our debt. All of them have been selling. And one of the reasons that China is able to snap up resources around the world is precisely that it has all these dollars to spend. But you'll notice that that already the Chinese are going around making arrangements with every other country in the world um, to make sure they can do transactions without dollars. They had somebody they had somebody in in Frankfurt a little while back making arrangements to do just uh, yuan to euro without dollars involved. Um, the the Chinese prime minister or premier or whatever is is in was in Seoul in Korea the other day. They're going around the world setting up all of these alternative financial arrangements so that when the dollar crashes, when the dollar becomes effectively worthless, as it, as I said, and I think they're quite right to do this because it will. Once that happens, it's not going to affect them that much. You know, they, they okay, they lose two trillion dollars worth of na- of um, assets in their national bank. They've got. Um, hundreds of billions of euros. They've got plenty of other currencies in their national bank. And, and a lot of other countries. You can watch them getting ready for the dollar to go away. Exactly what's going to trigger that is an interesting question, but I wouldn't want to have too much of your wealth in dollar-denominated um, instruments. One thing that always concerned me, and uh, I don't think there's really a straight answer to this, is in unwinding a lot of this you know, nonsense paper, fictitious debt, um, that's piled up over the years that are, you know, international banks owe each other and maybe some mm-hmm. corporations are involved, is where, if such defaults start to happen, where the line kind of occurs in terms of having a negative effect on the real economy mm-hmm. of productive companies or even down to the level of individuals. Because oh, yeah. I can't imagine how you could have a lot of, you know, large-scale international defaults without even just by the psychology of it spreading, you know, some sort of contagion that would come down to affect, you know, you and I in, at some oh. level. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When the, thing, the, the crisis phase of this is going to be very difficult for most people because, I mean, most businesses have a rolling line of credit and that's how they manage their affairs. Um, mo- I don't know whether this is true in the, in, in, on your side of the pond, but in the United States, anybody who can afford a credit card has one and uses it constantly. And... You know, cash is fair is not that often seen, uh, you know, above a certain level in the poverty class, and so yeah, you've got this situation where, during the actual crisis period itself, which could be a matter of weeks or months, a lot of businesses will simply shut down. A lot of um, you know, a lot of banks will not be able to accept payments. Um, People will be scrambling to figure out how to get food. And this, this is what happened in, in 1931, 1932, when the global banking system froze up in the wake of the Great Depression. And you had situations where people had you know, a $1,000 paycheck in their pockets and they could not cash it because every bank in the United States had shut its doors. And yeah, the, the, now one thing to keep in mind is that there are solutions to this. There are emergency measures, as happened in 31 and 32. Um, actually, in 33 specifically, once Franklin Roosevelt got in, they did a flurry of emergency measures, got the banks open again, and staggered through the rest of the Great Depression with a lot of problems, but um, nothing like the kind, of, um, the kind of difficulty at the peak of the crisis. In the same way, Everybody reads about the German inflationary collapse in 1923, you know, the, the gallons of milk costing 10 trillion marks and this kind of stuff. Um, yes, that happened, and then it stopped. Because there are political ways to stop this kind of thing, you, you know, anything, anything up to and including declaring martial law. And these are, you know, economic crises happen. And if we study economic crises, you can look at this and say, okay, here's what it looks like. Here are some things that may help um, you and I and other you know, ordinary people get through it. And it's going to have a lifespan of a matter of um, maybe a year or so at most. And then we come up the other side with a new economy and um, a lot less wealth 
and we pick up and go. But getting there is going to be rough, and the fact that when the, when the next big economic reset happens, Americans are going to go from controlling about um, a third of the world's wealth to controlling maybe 5 or 10% of it. And so a lot of people on this side of the pond are going to get very poor in a hurry. In reading about the hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic, um, I discovered that at one point, uh, one ounce of gold would have bought you an entire city block in Berlin. And oh, yeah. uh, I'm ho- holding on to my handful of Krugerrands and uh, maybe I can um, achieve the same miraculous feat at <laughs> some point down the line. But then the, the thought also occurred to me that I might become a very unpopular landlord if everyone else around me is starving. <laughs> well, the, the the trick in this kind of situation, if you've got the Krugerrands, okay, buy the block and then start a soup kitchen and fund it. Make sure... A little bit of generosity goes a long way in depression situations. So you know, don't don't be selfish about it. That you know, your ounce of gold may buy you a block, uh, you know, a city block in your favorite UK city. Um, it will take a, you know, some very small shavings of an ounce of gold to keep um, a soup kitchen supplied with bread and, and, and bean soup. So you know, be generous. In hard times, it works. With regards to property prices, we could you know discuss that all day because um, it's another it's a bellwether really for people's thoughts about and their feelings about the future. And it's a very powerful psychological thing. And even after the crash of '08, uh, the government will be going through extraordinary gyrations. I know there've been similar things in the U.S. to try and get anybody who cannot afford a property to match them up with one. <laughs> well, that's one of the places where. Um, the investment economy interacts with the um, with the economy of actual goods and services because real estate is a classic investment vehicle, and so it's driven the cost of real estate to just absurd prices um, all over the UK, as far as I know, along the coasts and in a few other areas in the United States. Here, it's surprisingly patchy. Um, the place the place that I live now, which is a very nice four bedroom brick house, in a a, a, a you know, um, former milk town in, in north central Appalachia, mind you, and it cost me the equivalent of about forty thousand uh, pounds. I know I'm the, the, I, there are no extra zeros. There, it's it, you can get you. I mean, in, in Detroit, if you want a house, you can usually buy one for like a hundred bucks, and that's the filing fee down in the city. Um, if you have the capacity to make a living where you, without having a, like a job without having to find an employer to pay you, um, you can live extremely well in the impoverished areas in the United States. But, and that, that, that's because a lot of those areas have been able to reset their property values to something closer to the, to the real world rather than the kind of mark to make believe stuff that you have in, in our large cities and, or large coastal cities and in most of the UK. Oh, I mean, not even impoverished parts of the UK, but you can find extraordinarily nice properties, for example, in the West of Wales or in um, parts of Scotland that are away from the capital, the big urban Mm -hmm. centres. And these are some of the most beautiful places in the British Isles, but maybe the infrastructure isn't so good, uh, Mm -hmm. maybe job opportunities aren't so good. Well, there won't be any. Yeah, there won't be any jobs at all, and that's the issue, of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and that's why you can go and get this wonderful seaside cottage. Um, maybe you know, for the sort of money that you're talking about, this idyllic place to live, if mm-hmm. if you can keep yourself ticking over without having to go into an office every day. And you see, what, one of the things that that I've been arguing in my blog recently, and it's it's really important to, that people start thinking beyond going into an office. This habit of going to an employer to get a job is a habit from the, you know, it's, it's, it's a 20th century. It's basically, I don't know anybody who is, empl- who is employed by an employer who works for somebody in the usual fashion who's actually doing well right now. They're either, people are either scrambling, they're, they're, if they're lucky, they're, they're just holding their own level. Many cases, they're struggling to survive, they're having cutbacks, they're losing benefits, they're having hours cut, or they're facing pink flips and, and having to find something to do in a country that doesn't have much in the way of unemployment insurance left. Um, so basically, finding ways to make a living outside the ordinary economy of employment is really a, a premium task right now. and something that, that people need to be thinking about because the, the employers, by and large, are dependent on that finance economy. They've got to have the credit. They've got to have the, you know, they, they're, they, they get money from the banking system. They, they use the credit card system. They're dependent on these flows of financial, um, 
hallucination that make up the, 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 so much of our economy these days. And so finding a way to make a living that doesn't put you in direct dependence on that is a, should be a fairly high priority for most of us. And now that's going to involve a lower standard of living. But this is something I've been saying for a long time anyway. The, the, the phrase, the kind of half-joking phrase is collapse now and avoid the rush. If you start living now the way you're going to have to live once the reset happens, um, you're going to have a lot more flexibility and you'll know how to do it. In terms of, of doing just that, I mean, I would refer listeners to an interview that uh, that we did back at the start of this year on your book, Green Wizardry, if they're looking for some ideas. But big problem that we have is really a skills deficit. We talked about you know, deindustrialization in terms of domestic manufacturing and uh, an economy that famously described as the service economy, which seems to mm-hmm. involve working at Walmart or McDonald's. Uh, right. Not mm-hmm. a lot of transferable skills beyond using a till or maybe mm-hmm. t- taking out trash. And <laughs> that's that's a real problem going forward in terms of what I mean, people can go out and they can learn to do something practical. But how many people are able to do that right now or have the get up and go to just get off their backsides and actually do something like that? That's questionable. It's, it's, but, but that's going to determine who's going to, who's going to get through the approaching, the approaching series of resets in relative comfort and who's going to um, have to scramble for survival and possibly not make it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it really, it's, it really is a sort of Darwinian selection. Those people who are willing to look at the future and say, oh my God, we are facing a real mess. We have to, you know, I, I, me personally, have to get off my butt and go do something about this, like learn some skills, like um, develop some other, some other ways of making a living that don't depend on having some employer pay me a, a weekly or monthly paycheck. Um, and those people who do that are going to come through. And those people who don't, many of them will not. It, you know, it really is... I don't, I don't want to come across in, in a sort of faux apocalyptic mode, but this is a kind of situation where people don't necessarily survive. And it's not the end of the world, but that's small consolation if you're the one starving to death in the street. An interesting personal anecdote from a few years ago. I would have been, what, 40, 41 years old, and I worked for a year um, on an organic farm. Mm-hmm. And uh, it wasn't too arduous, but certainly for someone who hasn't really done physical work of that nature before, it was quite a learning experience um, involved getting there at 7 a.m. Mm-hmm. Uh, no matter what the weather, you know, freezing cold, rain, too bad, just show up. Well, uh, this, is, this is Britain. Of course it was freezing cold and rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was in August. Uh, get, the, get the work done and basically you stop when the work's finished. So if it's 2 p.m. you're finished, fine, go home. If it's 5 p.m., you, know, you work until the work is done. Mm-hmm. And it involved initially, you could turn up at 7 o'clock in the morning in freezing rain and move around about one ton of produce by hand, just carting mm-hmm. it around. And I was talking to the farmer because I had great interest in the future of um, food production. And I was saying to him, you know, so I think organic farming is the only type of farming that really has a long-term future. And he said, I hope so. And I asked him, so, but someone like me, I'm a middle-aged guy, um, you know, shouldn't you be And there's all these you know, youths running around um, unemployed, feckless, nothing to do. And he said, I've tried employing younger people. He said, generally speaking, they can't get here on time. And when they realize what the work involves, they just, you can see despair in their eyes. He's had kids show up on his farm at 7 a.m. And come a noon for their lunch break, they go home never to come back. They cannot face it. And that's mm-hmm. a, definitely a generational thing. Yeah, well, you know, if they can't face that, there's a lot of other things they're not going to be able to face too. Because, again, one of the things that this, that um, a couple of centuries of fossil fuels have blinded us to is the necessity for plain, old, ordinary, muscular labor. We've had the the the, the, the term that's used is energy slaves. In the United States, every human being has like 300 energy slaves. The the energy equivalent of 300 slaves working for them eight-hour shifts, seven days a week. And as those energy slaves go away, there's a lot of work that still has to be done. And those people who have, who have the physical stamina and the will and, the, you know, and, and, and recognize the necessity of doing it are going to get by. And those who don't are not. You talked about lowering standards of living, which 
you know, and again, it's the same this side of the pond, in a, it, societies where material wealth is prized in many cases above all else, having not having those gadgets and the, you know the luxuries is very difficult to take for some people. Of course, it's all mm-hmm. illusory nonsense. But again, a lot of the issues here are psychological, and there, there's a lot of we talked earlier about property prices, and there's also a lot of emphasis still on on consumerism and on keeping that afloat. I mean, one of the most depressing spectacles for me personally is watching the videos uh, on Black Friday when sometimes you know people are are killed they mm-hmm. die in uh, trying yeah, to get some trainers yeah, or something stomped to the ground under a crowd of shoppers and until they die yes the thing is human beings can place their sense of value of meaning of purpose in life or what have you in some remarkably stupid places and there are a lot of people right now who their, their idea of what makes life worth worth living has to do with the latest stupid computer gadget, or the latest, the latest video game, or or owning or owning such and such house in such and such place, or all of these things, and these people are facing a truly horrible fate. Because I can't think of anything more more grisly than having your entire heart set on that kind of life as it goes away forever. And this is the thing. The, the the economy of the industrial age, with its this mass drawdown of of fossil fuels that took half a billion years to put there, we have just burnt through the richest, the most concentrated, the most abundant energy source our species will ever know. And the thing, and, and we've mostly wasted on on stupid things. And but now we have a whole population of people who are used to millions and millions of people who are used to thinking of that as what matters in life as it goes away forever. And what a horrible fate because everything that matters to them is over. Everything that matters to them is trickling away and they don't know it because they, they've bought in. Most of them have bought into the mythology of progress. They believe that it's onward and upward forever. And so it must be their fault. <laughs> It's going to get ugly. It's really going to get ugly as it starts sinking in that they can't have these things anymore. That you know, will they will they go into mass scapegoating? Will they go into um, suicidal depression? There's all kinds of ugly possibilities, but it's not going to end. It's not going to be pretty. It is just this is just not going to end well. It reminds me of the. Uh, do, do you remember the Obama phone thing? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what was going on there. Some I really don't know the details, but it's something to do with the government and free mobile phones. But and we got some coverage of what we're here, and there was some woman just absolutely gibbering, just Obama phone, Obama phone, Obama's fixing to get me a phone. She was going to get a free mobile phone, so therefore mm-hmm. Obama was the man. And mm-hmm. it was it really was bread and circuses time. It was like you know that no longer even just to do it in an abstract way. It's like literally physically give these people something, and it'll shut them up. But um, in terms of going forward, I mean, I mentioned your book, Green Wizardry. To be positive, there are opportunities here. And, you know, things are going to be ugly to a greater or lesser extent in the next couple of decades. You know, certainly, as someone said, you know, the next hundred years is going to be nothing like the last hundred years. But uh, there are opportunities out there. And because people still need food, clothing, all sorts exactly. of things that, and, and, and also culture, you know, there's, there will, there's still a place for literature and art and all the rest of it. It's mm-hmm. going to change. So if we can reorientate ourselves, I think that that's one thing that the recession of consumerism does hold mm-hmm. out is that, you know, maybe not in our lifetimes, but, you know, for future generation that actually a, a form of good life can return. It just won't look like it does now. Well, of course, of course. And the thing is, in the same principle that people can assign their sense of value and meaning and purpose to a wide range of things. And sticking them on getting a free cell phone is not really productive, but there's a lot of other things that that can make your life worth living. And people are going to need goods and services. They are going to need food and shelter and clothing. They're going to need a lot of other things too. Those people who are willing to grapple with that, come to terms with it, say, okay, I get this. And then do things like get in the kind of physical shape where you can put in a hard day's labor day after day. Do the kind of thing, you know, if you're physically up for that. Um, There are, there's a range of things that you can do to prepare yourself for this sort of thing. Some of which I covered in my book, Green Wizardry. Some of which, you know, are beyond that. But again, collapse now and avoid the rush. If you get ready now, it's not going to be a trauma. 
if you don't get ready now, um, you know, and it's a matter of you have to show up at 7 o'clock in the morning to do that work, or you don't eat, then it's going to be a trauma. And that's, and I think that's the, the story. The, the story that the farmer told is a bellwether because now we live in a time where if you know you can't hack um, a, a sun up to sundown of hard work, you've got other options. Twenty years from now, maybe not. So, time to learn how to live in a less energy rich less comfortable, less cozy environment. And you'll be fine when that environment shows up on your front door. Now, a lot of your book it concerns politics and how the political process or lack of it in some cases is kind of getting in the way of all this. It's really making a bad situation worse. Mm-hmm. And we have profoundly polarized and dysfunctional politics at the minute. And again, in, in most democracies around the world in one form or another, but we're, again, concentrating on the U.S. because that's Mm -hmm. so emblematic of so many things. Mm -hmm. And even though overall policy direction in many cases is is the same, for example, you know, when Obama took over from Bush, there was no rolling, you know, he didn't close Guantanamo, he didn't bring the troops back to the Middle East. And, you know, I grew up in Ireland, in in Northern Ireland, the 70s and the 80s. And so I know about dysfunctional politics, but those raving lunatics had nothing on this current crop. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's an impressive bit of testimony. Um, yeah, the thing in the United States, what we've got is a one-party system disguised as a two-party system. The Democrats and Republicans claim to be different, and they act out this little charade every four years where they all have their captured constituencies. The Democrats go to the environmentalists and the feminists, and the Republicans go to the fundamentalist Christians, the gun owners, and they all go, "Well, yeah, we didn't do anything for you, but those other guys will be so much worse." And so all the captive constituencies vote as they're told, and we get um, you know, Obama, who comes in talking about change and hope, and gives us an amazingly inspired imitation of the third and fourth terms of George W. Bush. And that's, I mean, partly that's, that's because there's not a lot of wiggle room left in the political system. Any really serious change right now would run up against entrenched interests that have the capacity to veto it, or would cause um, the kind of economic turmoil that everybody is trying to avoid. But the difficulty here is that they're busy throwing away the last scraps of legitimacy that um, the U.S. government has in the eyes of its own population. Um, there was a, I, I forget exactly when, sometime in the last couple of weeks, there was this, this um, rather revealing poll that was done that determined that the the, num- the fraction of Americans, the percentage of Americans that actually have any conf- any real confidence in Congress to do anything at all, has, is now down to 7%. For the presidency, it's about 28%. So fewer than a third of Americans have any confidence in the, the political institutions that govern their lives. And it's not just the person who's in there, it's the institution, it's the office itself, or in the case of Congress, you know, the... <clears throat> well, never mind. Um, that kind of thing, when that kind of thing happens historically, you look at that and you look page of a few years ahead, you usually have the collapse of a system of government. Um, I'm thinking of what happened in the in post-Soviet Europe. I'm thinking of what happened. I mean, it's happened many, many times before. When the people of a nation simply stop believing in their system of government, when they simply decide, okay, these guys are a bunch of crooks who are just in it for themselves, or whatever it happens to be. If they lose trust in the, in the competence and the functionality of their governmental system, they don't even have to overthrow it. All they have to do is stop supporting it, and it starts breaking down, and eventually it falls apart. And so one of the ways, if, if I may recur to or revert to an earlier topic of discussion, one of the ways that the U.S. Um, debt could be, <clears throat> well, not paid off, but erased, is if the, United, the government of the United States, the current U.S. government, were to implode leaving U.S. bonds the way that, say, the bonds of Tsarist Russia uh, were suddenly devalued in 1917. That could happen. And because we have this utterly polarized, utterly gridlocked, utterly dysfunctional politics right now, um, which here at least is largely divided regionally, um, there's one set of policies that um, play along the coast, there's another set of policies that play in the northern part of the center. There's another set of policies that play in the southern part of the center. 
and they are not the same policies, and nobody can get past the gridlock. So one possible one 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 of the things that that I've discussed um, in my blog, in, in the book, and elsewhere is the possibility that the United States may simply break apart, become several different third world countries rather than just one banana republic. And the political system is sufficiently sufficiently paralyzed at this point. I don't know that that could be stopped once it got going. Just on that note, there's some talk, serious talk, I don't know how far advanced it is, but about states' secession. What do you think the prospects for that are? Fairly high. The thing is, there is actually, there's actually a mechanism in the U.S. Constitution that would allow this to happen. What would, all that it would take is that um, two-thirds of the states would have to call for a constitutional convention. The convention would then be held. It would pass an amendment to the Constitution which would um, allow states to leave the Union. It would be that simple. Then three quarters of the states would have to vote to approve the amendment. Once that happened, it's the law of the land. Nobody else has any say over it, not the president, not the Supreme Court, not Congress. It's in the, in the Constitution. And then states can leave. They could also simply pass a, an amendment to the Constitution ab- abolishing the Constitution, dissolving the Union. There's all kinds of ways they could do it. But that hatches there. And in fact, if in 1860, at the beginning of our Civil War, um, if the southern states had been a little less pig-headed, they could, yeah, you could easily imagine Jefferson Davis, who was a U.S. senator in those days, standing up in Congress saying, you know, none of us want this war that's breathing down our necks. We need to solve this problem in a peaceful manner. Here's the amendment to the Constitution that I am introducing, which will allow states to leave. It probably would have passed. I could, see a, I could very easily see a situation where, in the face of terminal gridlock, that such an amendment could be passed and acted on um, well, I mean, the, the thing is, this has happened before fairly recently. The way the Soviet Union broke up was quite simple. Actually, from the, the Soviet Constitution had a clause in it that allowed any of the member republics that are publicly to leave the Soviet Union anytime they wanted to. Now, of course, their ability to do so was constrained by the possibility of ending up with a bullet in the brain during, say, Stalin's regime. But that's how the Soviet Union finally dissolved. People just said, oh, okay. It's in the Constitution. We're going to walk. And at that point, Gorbachev had no capacity to stop them. So away they went. And that could happen to the United States as well. Um, Will it? I don't know. The supply of crystal balls is not keeping up with the demand. But it's a real possibility and one that um, I know that a number of states have already begun exploring the possibility of holding a constitutional convention to make some of the changes they feel are needed. Just how far will that go? We'll see. Well, I think it's in New Hampshire. They've got something called the Free State Project, and what they're trying mm-hmm. to do is get like-minded people to all move there and then change the local, you know, statutes and what have you. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of a form of it. Um, against this background of tremendous public apathy uh, and disengagement um, with politics, there's this phenomenon where the gap between the political uh, rhetoric and actual reality. Uh, becomes too wide and that's something that we're really really seeing now particularly in terms of the economy where politic politicians are getting up and saying you know here are the growth figures but then you know collapse is happening all around people and at some point the cognitive dissonance gets too much and um, I think that's really the one of the phenomena to are watching for right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There, there was a there was a um, social critic named um, Bertram Gross, I think it was, back in the 70s, wrote a book called Friendly Fascism, which if you can find it, is well worth reading. One of the things that he noted is that in his t- already in that time, economic indicators were being turned into what he called economic vindicators, basically statistics manufactured and massaged to support whatever the government policy happened to be. We've got a nearly complete case of that these days. Um, when they when they come out with the unemployment figures in the United States, okay, those are completely fictional. If you no longer get unemployment insurance, you're not counted in the U.S. You're not counted as unemployed anymore. And since we have a huge number of people who've run out of their unemployment, they've passed their 99 weeks, they're out on their ear. They have no source of income. They don't have a job, but they're not officially unemployed because that would look bad. And there are all of these complicated statistical maneuvers being put into all current U.S. government statistics to make them look better than they, than they actually are. It's really quite remarkable. 
And yeah, the level of cynicism with such figures rises every time you know Obama or uh, George W. Bush before him or whoever opens his mouth, insisting that the economy, you know, the corner has been turned. The economy is in recovery. Um, too bad for all you tens of millions of people who don't have enough to eat tonight. <clears throat> it, 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 yeah, as the cognitive dissonance opens, political apathy is a dangerous thing because it generally takes place in that interval between when you think you can change society and when you have to make something change in order to keep food on the table. And I don't think the leaders of the political system in this country certainly are paying attention to the number of people who have lost faith in the system as it exists and are drifting closer and closer to that point where um, doing something, however radical, however potentially violent, is the only option they see before them. And as more and more people pile up against that ladder barrier, things could get really ugly here in the United States. Well, I suppose the other side of the political apathy coin, if we can put it like that, is mm-hmm. the sort of pressure uh, for the rise of, of a third party. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I know in the US you have Ron Paul there, but he stood as an independent and as a Republican. But you see that the demonizing, whatever you think of the guy, you see how he's demonized and attacked. And mm-hmm. there's been other third party candidates um, you know, responding to the basically what you've got with the main two-party system, and you certainly got that in this country, is that, you know, which flavor of bullshit do you want? And, you know, w- w- which color? Yeah. And I don't know if you've observed the rise of the UK Independence Party over oh, yeah. here, but I mean, that's something, again, they're all, again, don't have to agree with them, but the, the political establishment are all over them. And this mm-hmm. opens the way, if you think Ron Paul's a good guy, this also opens the way for the potential rise of a demagogue, you know, it, as things, but you look at Hitler, for example, or how he came to power. And there was a quote from a documentary I watched the other day, uh, it was from James Howard Kunstler. And he said, Americans will elect maniacs who promise to allow them to keep their McMansions and suburbs and big box stores. Well, that's basically what we're doing now. <laughs> yeah. But the, the maniac that I'm worried about is not, not so much um, the kind of corn point Hitler that, that Jim talks about. Um, the, the, one of the things that's been going on with the, with the freezing, with the collapse of, of American democratic politics, is that at this point there's a widening gap between the policies that are acceptable within the political system in our one-party system disguised as a two-party system and the, par- the policies that people actually want to see enforced, that they actually want to see in place. As that gap widens, the demagogue who we have to worry about is actually very much like um, Adolf Hitler. I mean, he was a young war vet, earned the Iron Cross for bravery under fire. Um, he had new ideas. He was talking. He, his followers were mostly, he had enormously, young, enormous draw among the young. Um, college students in Germany piled into the Nazi party long before it was popular anywhere else. And because he had, the, he had new ideas, he was talking to people in their own language, he was saying the things that the, that the, that the establishment wouldn't say, and so he built a political movement out of nothing. And we could ha- that could happen so easily here. If you can just imagine, let's say, you know, some some guy who'd done two terms in Afghanistan and had a, had a, you know the, the silver star for bravery under fire. He's a you know a, a likable, charismatic, folksy vet from from St. Louis. Okay, and he's talking. He's saying, look, the economy sucks. The, the government is lying to you. The government is saying uh, we're in a recovery. We're not in a recovery. You know that. I know that. We need to make these changes. We need to actually change things so that people can get decent jobs, not flipping burgers. Somebody like that could get power so easily in this country and just sweep everything before him very much the way that Hitler did. And then you're left having to depend on the good, um, the, the whatever good in or otherwise intentions your demagogue happens to have. Um, Mussolini is another good example. When a political system loses its legitimacy, one of the things you can get is uh, you know, a, a talented demagogue who, st- who starts telling people what, they're ready, what, what they want to hear rather than what the political system wants to tell them. Okay, well, another key pressure point in all of this unraveling, I think, is, comes from the fact that we have this pyramidal structure in society and the political elite and and others ultimately depend on not maybe the people right at the bottom, but there's a layer of enablers, mm-hmm. um, you know, the people that do the day to day work of governing, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the, the army, the police, all those bureaucrats and people like that. 
and they're going to get hammered as well. So at what point do they, some of those types of people say, do you know what? I ain't going to the office. You know, maybe I haven't been paid for a month or maybe I'm having to take measures against my next door neighbors. You know, that's my job. At what point do those people start saying no? It will be very interesting to see where that occurs and when. That's, that's always the question that matters because it's when a government loses control of those ordinary day-to-day functionaries that the government goes away. That's how revolution happens. Um, in in St. Petersburg in 1917, it was when the the, the the army started siding with the protesters that the Tsarist regime was finished, in the same way in Paris in 1789. Um, once you start getting the ordinary Joes and Janes, who, the ordinary, who are not typically not well paid, who are not members of the elite, who don't share the elite's values, who have the same values as their neighbors, and whose opinion of the central government has been declining at the same rate as everyone else's, once they say, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to follow those orders. Once that happens, it's over. Usually very quickly. I mean, historically, in a matter of days. Once that happens, it's over. So are, are the various governments paying attention to this? Of course they are. But can they actually do anything to stop it? That's a really complicated question because if they can't keep people generally from losing faith in the existing order, how can they keep the police believing in it? You know, they can increase their pay if they can afford to. But as you say, you know, what if they haven't been paid in a month? Well, we spoke earlier about um, opportunities going forward and even the necessity of equipping ourselves um, in terms of you know, our lifestyles and our skill set, whatever it happens to be, to face some of the challenges, particularly if, I mean, you and I are obviously, you know, how shall I put it, in the second half of our lives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's a lot of people just starting out now and facing this, you know, and mm-hmm. they're particularly well placed if they're smart about this to, uh, you know, mm-hmm. reposition themselves. But as, as well as doing that, uh, you know, don't wait for orders from headquarters, as they say, mm-hmm. a major part of the problem going forward, and I've said this many times, is psychological. It's mm-hmm. the emotional investment people have in their lifestyles and all the rest of it. And they, their personal identity is wrapped up in that. So I think a lot of work for a lot of people is going to begin within themselves, really. I don't want to sound too you know, metaphysical or spiritual about it, but really that's, you can change that's, your thinking, you can change everything. Yeah, and that's what it comes down to. One of the reasons that I've made a point in, in my blog and in the book we're discussing and in, in some further things is trying to challenge the sort of status quo idea that the world we live in is necessarily going to continue indefinitely getting you know, brighter and shinier toys as we head off toward, toward some kind of imaginary future of progress. That's not happening. It's not that even it's not going to happen. That isn't even happening now. In the United States, for most people, their standards of living have been, have been going down steadily since 1972. Unless you're in the top um, 20%, your standard of living is way down from where people in the same in the same class were in the 1970s. It's not getting better. It's not going to get better. And if people, the, the thing that I think people need to grasp is that we do live in an age of decline. Once you get that, once you see that we're not zooming off to some Star Trek future, we're not, progress is not happening anymore except in a few narrow technological fields. Once you grasp that, it becomes possible to look at your life and say, okay, what actually matters? What can I actually do something about? What are the real possibilities open in a declining society? On my blog, I'm I'm about to start an extensive discussion of dark ages and and what happens in the transition from a civilization to a dark age. We're in the middle of, well, we're in the early phases of that transition right now. Um, But we're in that transition right now. And if people can simply come to terms with the historical reality of their own times and not try to force fit them into the Procrustean bed of this fantasy of perpetual progress, then I think a lot of the psychological work is done. Because once you start thinking, okay, decline is here. It's now. It's happening around me. Then a lot of the barriers to doing doing something constructive about it go away in a hurry. John, there's reams of... Uh, topics that we didn't get to that are in your book once again just to remind listeners it's called decline and fall the end of empire and the future of democracy in 21st century america so people need to pick up a copy of that but um tell people about your blog um that's you know essential reading as far as i'm concerned and well anything else you'd like to share okay um the blog in question is the arch druid report um http colon slash 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 the arch druid report dot blogspot dot com and I post something there every Wednesday night. 
and it is a a kind of freewheeling commentary on um, life in an age of decline. Excellent. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. And thank you very much for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please check out the website. That's LegalizeFreedom.com, Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including world affairs, politics and economics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, conspiracy, and alternative history. You can also browse and buy a range of books and DVDs from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.